Thank you, Drs. Hu, Shu, and Gora. And we're going to go ahead and take questions. If the audience has any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat pod, and we'd love to answer them. So our first question is going to be for Dr. Gora. Will method development and validation be required for both RLD and test products? Uh, the short answer is yes. So although the ILD or the test product was generally designed to be similar or equivalent to ILD, however, there's a lot of factors are different, such as the manufacturing source of the API and the execution. So therefore, most of the uh, morphology features for the API and the execution could be different for ILD and the test product. So therefore, the message development and the validation are required for both ILD and the test product. Hopefully, because the drug product are designed and similar, the method should be uh, s similar, and the validation should be an easy process. OK, great. Thank you, Dr. Gore. We have one other question for you right now. Can we define morphology using traditional micros a traditional microscope using 40 times or 100 times magnification? Uh, it depends. If your sample only con contains one type of particles, such as you only have one type of API particles in your formulation, or the excipient will be solved, it is OK to characterize your drug product using traditional microscope. Otherwise, the traditional microscope cannot identify API and excipient particles. Uh, so there's not acceptable in that condition. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Hu. Can the EMD method be used for all particle size distribution data, such as monomodal Uh, hi, it's Meng. Uh, yes, I uh, I think methodology-wise, the EMD can be used for the uh, all kinds of uh, uh, PSG profile. However, uh, uh, for the for the monomodal PSG, as we mentioned, the D50 and the span uh, we consider is sufficient to describe the PSG, describe the monomodal PSG, and uh, the method has been uh, I think it has been long established. So uh, I think D50 and span for monomode uh, profile is it's, uh, it's sufficient. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Hu. We have another question for you. Could EMD approach, could the EMD approach be applied to a comparison of cascade impactation? Uh, this is a good question, a good thought. Uh, so as, as we mentioned, the, the EMD is useful for the histogram type data. So uh, it depends on how you organize the data uh, for the uh, cascade impact uh, 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 experimental data. Uh, but what I'm saying is uh, it's uh, methodology-wise uh, 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 eligible. Uh, and uh, uh, from what I know, there's another uh, methodology has been developed for for ca uh, cascade impact. It's called modified uh, modified car square ratio method. That's specifically designed for uh, for the cascade impact uh, 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 PSD data <coughs> PSD profile analysis. So I, I think uh, 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 this is not the uh, easy question to answer now. But if you would like to, uh, to uh, ask more, uh, feel free to contact us. Thanks. OK, and we have another question for Dr. Hu. Are there any recommended software algorithms for performing PBE tests or EMD transformations? Okay, uh, this is a good question. <laughs> so 
for PBE, I think the PBE method has been uh, has been there for a long time, so I, I will not uh, comment on that. But for EMD, since EMD, it's uh, although maybe uh, it's a little bit new for our area, but uh, for the uh, uh, for the data uh, data analysis and the machine learning uh, type of area, they are uh, the the EMD has been widely used. So there are several uh, available. Uh, 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 software uh, available for for use. So one of the uh, the software I'm using is a, there's an R package called EMD EMD Dist EMD D I S T. That that one uh, I think uh, it, it's a uh, uh, it's what I'm using. Thank you. Great. Thank you for taking questions. Our next question is for Dr. Xu. Xu. For robustness evaluation, you mentioned serial dilution to show method sensitivity. Is that for a specific method, or is that a general expectation? What about laser diffraction, where you typically don't pre-dilute sample? Do we still need to do serial dilution studies? Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. Um, actually, the purpose of the serial dilution is to evaluate and to measure the method if the first result as a measure of cost. And also, frequently, we see the serial dilution as beneficial uh, to reveal uh, about sample stability um, or, or a method issue with a measurement of the particle size. For example, uh, if a particle undergo, uh, undergoes dissolution, and if you have not saturated the dispersion, so then you will see effect uh, when you dilute the sample. Or if the autoglobin, for example, undergo uh, phase, uh, phase changes, the transformation, uh, if the medium choice is not, uh, is not, is not compatible. Uh, therefore, it's a good idea to, in, generally, uh, in general, evaluate the effect of serial dilution uh, just to see uh, whether the method is robust or not, and also to see whether um, sample stability uh, has an issue or not. But you did bring a good point, is that um, I think for different techniques, uh, we may need different approach to study dilution. Uh, the example you mentioned, or the question you mentioned, the laser diffraction, uh, yes, we typically don't pre-dilute the sample. The reason for that is because the dilution actually occurs during the measurement. Uh, the dispersion medium is, the volume is generally fixed, whether it's uh, 100 ml or, or 600 ml. So certainly the less the sample volume you had, the more dilutions um, of the samples. So in this case, uh, the serial dilution can be studied by uh, varying amount of the sample used into the dispersion unit. Uh, and I hope this answers your question. OK, thank you, Dr. Xu. I think we're having a little bit of a hard time hearing you, so hopefully if you can um, check the chat pod and increase your microphone volume, then We'll come back to you and ask definitely more questions. Um, our next question is going to be for Dr. Gore. Has acceptance criteria of less than 5% difference in D10, D50, and D90 been validated or demonstrated by data as practical and achievable for determining the minimum number of particles to be tested in MDRS method filter and sample size determination? In reference to your slide 21 and 22. Uh, yes, that's a good question. So in this presentation, uh, I used the example of 5% as an acceptance criteria for D10, D50, and D90 for determining the minimum number of particles to be, met, to be tested. Uh, this criteria is a practical and achievable from our experience. And uh, one more uh, suggestion is that the it's relatively easier for D50 to meet this criteria. D10 and D90 sometimes may have some challenge. And also, the 5% is just the example used for the method. And according to different uh, product you are investigating, it may be different. You need to make your own justification when you submit your method. I hope that answers the question.
Thank you, Dr. Gora. We have another question for you. Can Raman spectroscopy <laughs> help to identify the polymorphic form in a drug? Uh, the answer is yes. So for, for example, for API with different polymorphic forms, uh, their Raman spectrum normally are similar, very similar. But because they have given a polymorphic form, for example, anhydrous form or monohydrous form, there will be some slight difference in the spectrum. Just through a number. For example, the Raman spectrum for the API have about uh, 50 peaks. And in about 47 of the peaks will be identical for the two polymorphic forms. But the other three peaks, they may differ in the peak position and the relative uh, peak shape or peak intensity. So ba based on this slight difference in the Raman spectrum, we can identify different polymorphic forms for the API. OK, great. Thank you so much. Our next question, we're going to go back to Dr. Xu. And I think we're going to be able to hear you much better now. Is it required to apply internal sonication for PSD measurement for flocated suspension aggregates? Yeah, I hope you can hear me better now. Um, for the flocculated suspension, uh, the answer actually depends. Uh, if you are interested in the primary particles, then uh, the, it's better to uh, introduce first two is to evaluate the uh, aggregated form, then the uh, sonication should not be turned down. So it really depends. Uh, generally, uh, I guess if you are interested in the primary particle, then the answer is yes. Great, thank you so much. And I think we're going to go back to the first question because it was um, it's a very interesting question and it was just a little hard to hear. So you know, if you talk closer or a little louder, then um, I know our audience is really interested. So we'll go back to the first question. For robustness evaluation, you mentioned serial dilution to show method sensitivity. Is that for a specific method or a general expectation? What about laser diffraction where you don't typically you don't typically you typically don't pre-dilute sample. Do we still need to do serial dilution steps? Yeah, sorry about the microphone issue. I hope you can hear slightly better now. Uh, the purpose of the dilution, as I mentioned earlier, is to evaluate method, whether a method is robust or not, and also we want to look at sample stability issue. So. Uh, for example, if the particle dissolve or if the uh, oil globule uh, uh, cause phase changes. So in this case, uh, serial dilution can give us those information. Uh, but you mentioned a good point is that uh, I think some of the technique, uh, we may need to look at them differently for the dilution. Uh, for later diffraction, um, we don't typically pre-dilute because the dilution actually occurred during the measurement, as I mentioned. Um, so in this case, uh, changing the sample amount effectively changes the degree of dilution. And I hope this answers the question. Great, thank you. And that sounds um, so clear. So we have another question for you. Regarding an API that will be dissolved in the final formulation, what is FDA's expectation on PSD limits for that API? So I, I want to clarify, because uh, if an API is in the final formulation, is dissolved form, and assume it's a solution, they, then there is really no um, need for setting a PSD limit. However, my interpretation of this question uh, may uh, suggest also, for example, if the API is dissolved in a different phase, for example, if it's an oil and water emulsion, the drug API is dissolved in the oil phase, um, uh, but as, as, a, as a whole formulation, it's presented in, in a globular form. In this case, the particle size distribution, or the, in this case, globular size distribution, uh, is an important critical quality attribute. So uh, the expectation for the limit 
is again, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, uh, really depends on uh, what is the purpose. So for comparison purposes, then you have to demonstrate that the site is comparable to the ILD product or the reference RS product. Great, thank you. And we have one last question for you. For injectable suspensions, what is the proper PSD method? For generic injectable suspension, what is the minimum number of RLD batches required for the PSD compared to Um, for the injectable suspension, I think one, it depends on the size range. Uh, typically, we know the suspension, if it's intramuscular or subcutaneous, um, generally those size range are in the micron size range. So uh, we frequently see laser diffraction as a, as a more common method for, for particle size measurement. And however, if the suspension, injectable suspension is in the, in the sub-micron uh, range, then certainly you would consider other uh, techniques such as uh, dynamic line scattering could be another option for you to uh, evaluate the particle size distribution. Um, the the minimum number of batches, uh, I think that's three batches if it's available. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much. And our next question is for Dr. Hu. How much statistical deviation is permitted for PSD in EMD? And which program should we use? We had a couple questions, again, about software. So that's definitely very um, a lot of interest that you can address it as well. Sure, sure. Yes, thank you. So I, I will repeat uh, the, the answer for, 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 the, for the question about the software for EMD. So as I said, EMD is a, it's a widely use and uh, well develop the, the algorithm. So there are several available software. Uh, most of them are free. Uh, uh, on the uh, if you use you Google, you will you will see several uh, options. Uh, for me, I'm using a R package named EMD uh, IST. That's the the software I'm using. So regarding the question, uh, how many deviation allowed? As I as I described in the slides. Uh, after calculating the, the the EMD value, we we apply PBE to test the, the EMD value from from the group test and reference. Then uh, then the, then the allowance will be represented in the in the statistical uh, uh, testing. So so uh, uh, the, 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 then PBE do their work to differentiate. Uh, whether two group group of uh, EMD it's uh, acceptable for B or not. Thank you. All right, great. And our last question again is for Dr. Hu. The constant of 2.089 was based on log transform data. Would the agency accept other another constant? For example, a constant derived based on linear transformed data. And if so, what kind of justifications for this new constant are expected by the agency? A simple question to answer here, but what I can say is, uh, if you if you want to uh, uh, pursue uh, or propose an uh, 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 alternative BE limit using different data distribution. Uh, you should uh, 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 you should provide a sufficient justification uh, from from my perspective uh, uh, at the least and the most important you have to justify uh, with your limit then the type one, the type error type one and type two especially type one type one error should be uh, well controlled uh, and also this this question uh, as I said it's not a simple question you should involve uh, uh, bio, uh, Office of Biostatistical. So uh, that's my input. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Drs. Hu, Xu, and Guar, for all of your, um, your, your presentations and taking time to discuss um, all of these topics with us. And with that, we are actually going to go to a lunch break to give our speakers and our AV team a break and hopefully to give you guys time to have lunch. So 
and check your email. So we will see you at 105 Eastern. And we've got a really great afternoon coming up. Our next topic is development and validation considerations.